Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.
from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the ninth chapter, beginning at the 16th verse. If I proclaim the gospel, this gives me no ground for boasting, for an obligation is laid on me, and woe to me if I do not proclaim the gospel. For if I do this on my own will, I have a reward. But if not of my own will, I am entrusted with a commission. What then is my reward? Just this, that in my proclamation I may make the gospel free of charge, so as to not make full use of my rights in the gospel. For though I am free with respect to all, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so that I might win those under the law. To those under outside the law, I became as one outside the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, so that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that I might be all means, save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, so that I may share in its blessings. The word of the Lord. The next is God. sundown they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons and the whole city was gathered around the door and he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him in the morning while it was still very dark he got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed and Simon and his companions hunted for him when they found him they said to him everyone is searching for you he answered, Let's go to the neighboring towns, so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus responds by saying, let us go to the neighboring towns 
so that, so that I may proclaim the message there also, for that is what I came out to do. So here is my various, uh, very obvious observation, and that is that Jesus, that if Jesus is in the neighboring towns, he will not be in Capernaum. In practicality, what this means is that there will be sick people in Capernaum who will not be healed. For you see, in Jesus becoming incarnate and dwelling among us, he willingly took on limitations to his divinity, and one of those is the ability to only be at one place at one time. And outside of stating the obvious, this does bring up something which may make us uncomfortable, and that is the fact that while Jesus was on this earth, he didn't heal everybody. There were still sick people in Capernaum who would not be cured. However, by the same token, if Jesus had stayed in Capernaum and cured all who were there, he would not have been able to cure the people in the neighboring towns. However you decide to slice it, you end up with a scenario where someone who is sick is not going to get cured. And this limitation on one's power to affect a particular situation is a fact of life not just for Jesus during the time of his earthly ministry, but for all of us. And what all of this points out is that while we are on this earth, sometimes good things will happen to us, and sometimes they won't. Decisions that we make may benefit someone, but at the same time might hurt someone else. Our time spent on this earth is uneven. I'm sure we've all known wonderful people who have encountered tragedies in their lives, and most likely we've encountered some of these ourselves. And the question for us is how do we resolve the fact that everything in our lives does not go perfectly with the fact that we worship a good and loving God? Amy and I were having a discussion the other day about how we often have a transactional relationship with God. What we meant by this was we had a relationship where we came to God with a list of problems, and then it was God's duty to fix whatever problems we have presented him. If God comes through and takes care of our problems, well, then he's a good God and we'll continue to worship him. However, if God does not take care of our wish list, then we're free to be mad at God and maybe even move on and find a new God. But is that right? Is God only worthwhile when we get what we want? Well, I think the answer is no. But I also think we need to be fair in how we address the question. When we say God does not give us what we want, it can sound like we want something selfish, a nicer car or a bigger house. But there are often times in which what we want is something good and noble, the recovery of a sick child or the restoration of a broken relationship. So the question we need to think about in all of this is how do we deal with the fact that sometimes Jesus moves on to another town? What I mean by this is not everyone gets healed. Not all good requests are granted. In today's story, there are those who showed up that morning with an ailment only to find that Jesus was not there, and so their chances to be healed had dissipated. In our lives, we've probably all encountered a time where we prayed and someone did not recover. On August 31st of last year, I received a text from Julie Pay telling me that Father Pay had gone into the hospital and that he needed our prayers. During my daily broadcast, I asked all of you to pray for him, which I'm sure you did. And at around 8 p.m. that same day, Father Pay died. So what do we conclude? Do we say that God does not answer prayers, or that God only answers some prayers, or if we want to get more Pentecostal about it, that all of us, that we may have prayed incorrectly, so God didn't hear us? How do we reconcile the idea that God tells us to pray, and then sometimes those prayers go unanswered? I don't have a perfectly satisfactory answer. Sure, we can console ourselves by saying that the person we prayed for who died is now in a better place, and that, or that we do not see things in the way that God sees them. But I'm not sure if that makes everything better, at least in the short term. And I'm not sure that God wants us to pretend that everything is okay when something is obviously wrong. I mean, Jesus did weep at the death of Lazarus. He didn't say that God wanted another angel. The best thing I can say in terms of how we should think about the proper way of dealing with tragedy and the seemingly unanswered prayers that may accompany them is that we might need to examine what it is we think about prayer in general. If our definition of prayer is strictly transaction, 
like those who are looking for Jesus today, we're probably going to find prayer less than satisfactory. That is, if we look at prayer in the framework of we ask and God responds, then at some point we're going to receive a response that's not what we want. I'm sure that those who were left in Simon and Andrew's hometown may have had a different view of Jesus than those who had been healed on the previous day. However, if we expand our view of prayer and how we interact with God, we still might not always get what we want, but we will draw closer to God. If we move prayer to being something of a continuing conversation with God about all things, C.S. Lewis put it in this way, I pray because I can't help myself. I pray because I'm helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking and sleeping. It doesn't change God. It changes me. In my mind, the whole point of church and the whole point of prayer and any interaction with God is holiness. In other words, if we approach God in the same way we approach our car mechanic, then we're missing the point of our time spent on this terrestrial ball. Our time should be spent growing closer to God and loving God so that this love permeates us. As the prophet Isaiah reminds us, the grass withers and the flowers fail, but the word of our God endures forever. Our prayers should be about growing in love towards that which does not fade, but for the things which endure forever. Now this doesn't mean that we should not be sad when something tragic happens, but rather it means that our faith should not be built on what God can do for us in a given moment. And while there are theological explanations for why bad things happen and why prayers go unanswered, the important thing is to never stop praying. If you read through the Psalms, you will see that there are prayers of joy, prayers of petition, but there are also a lot of prayers of questioning, asking God, how long will this go on? We do not always know why Jesus moves on to the next town. But we should never stop our conversation with him so that we may be his this day and forevermore. Amen. We believe in one God. The Father, God the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world. For our Bishop, Justin Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Matthew and Keith, our assisting bishops, Jeffrey Lee, our provisional bishop, Philip, our parish priest, and Robert and Lee, our associate priest. For this gathering, and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and, and the well-being, and for the well-being of all people, especially Joseph, our president, Tony, our governor, Tammy and Ron, our senators, and Scott, our representative. Pray for justice and peace. I ask you first for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison, especially David, Bonnie, Eric.
Mary and Marie. Pray for those that are in need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or for knowledge of Him. Pray that they may find and be found by Him. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own name. O Lord our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins, through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. And now may the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his court.
may flesh give cause to light and shine in our hearts to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voice in the name of the dark angels with all the company of heaven and forever sing this hymn with the heavenly glory.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord. And the blessing of God.